Amen. Well, it's good to see everybody this morning. And yeah, the kids come out to Children's Church. And we'll get started. Um, yeah, we had a wonderful time yesterday uh, at the conference for Word of Life leaders, for uh, youth and children. Uh, we got to lead worship for that and then do a little session on uh, church security. Um, just a little bit to do with my background. So I um, had a lot of good conversations with really church leaders all over Western New York. So that uh, was a great time to um, encourage and uh, build up some of our leaders in other churches. So I'm glad to get to be a part of that. Um, so if you don't know, my name is Michael. I'm the pastor here. And uh, as usual, I love to see you, see your faces. Uh, if you're new, um, then let us know. Uh, fill out a visitor card. I love to get connected with you um, after service and this week to follow. If you're online, then I can't see you, but I'm glad you're here. Uh, we'd love to connect you uh, with you in a little bit different way. Um, leave a comment on the Facebook page or uh, the video, and we'll get in touch with you uh, after that. So <clears throat> we're in a new series. Uh, we started last week um, just talking about mental health. We talked about depression last week. It's, it's kind of a departure from a lot of the stuff that I've done in, in the past. In fact, I don't ever really remember doing a series uh, totally dedicated to uh, mental health on a Sunday morning. And so uh, my guess is that when you hear that phrase, mental health, you think, Oh, that's not me. But the truth is that you know, throughout our lives, we all struggle with different things. And you might have a season of depression or uh, of ang anxiety uh, or of anger. And my hope is that as we walk through this, uh, we won't see this as, a, as our deacons were talking about this and praying beforehand. Uh, we won't see this as a what's wrong with you <laughs> kind of series. Uh, and if you say there's nothing, then there probably is. And so uh, we're, we don't want to be about that, about just pointing out our failures and our shortcomings. But simply just saying, is there an area of our lives uh, where maybe we need to work on, or maybe an area that we're right right now we're not even aware of, and just to reveal some of that, peel back those layers. Uh, I know it's um it's uncomfortable at times. In fact, when I'm confronted with my own sin, I feel uncomfortable. Uh, I feel like that's not something I want to have a conversation about, uh, or even just simply the areas that maybe we just need a little bit of help. Okay, and so I'm hoping that. Uh, that is what we can do as we walk through this. And so we'll be in two different books. We'll be in Exodus, uh, easy to find in the Old Testament. So you turn to the front of your Bible, Genesis, Exodus. Uh, and so you can go ahead and turn there, Exodus chapter 2. And then we'll be in John chapter 2. And we're going to look at two different situations, uh, a perspective of an of a amazing leader in history, in uh, really our Christian faith, Moses, and how he handled the situation. Uh, and more than that, just how God used somebody uh, who, who, who is maybe not a perfect leader. In fact, if you're looking for that person, you won't find them. You won't find a perfect church, and you won't find a perfect leader. And you look throughout the Bible, everybody throughout the Bible had one issue or another, right? So we're not perfect, and that's okay. And we're just doing life together this way and trying to figure out how to navigate it. And then we'll look to John chapter 2 and the life of Jesus and how he handled situations. He was God, so he was perfect. And so we, we just simply go, kind of like what Andy said. Uh, I love that graphic. As we attempt to do life together and we examine ourselves and each other, we say, how can we more uh, better or more easily or, or just in uh, maybe a better practice of becoming more like Jesus and looking more like him? Will we ever be perfect? No. Will we ever match up entirely? Uh, hopefully we get closer to that as we come to the end of our lives, right? That's the goal, okay? Uh, so we're talking about anger today, and I know maybe you saw the Facebook page, you're like, oh, anger, that's great. You know what? I know exactly who this message is for, and I can think of them right now. And you know what? I'm gonna even start praying for that person right now. But but just maybe as we as we go through this series, you know, I, I want us to just do a little more self examination than we do of uh, let hold on, let let me help you. In fact, Jesus said something about that. He said you might want to take the log out of your own eye before you take the speck out of somebody else's. Okay, so let's go through this and uh, do this together. We're talking about anger, and the phrase that just kept coming to my mind. I don't know why. Um, uh, was was this phrase you've probably heard it before? You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. <laughs> okay, yeah, who knows where that's from? Okay, about a few. All right. So uh, you can say it out loud if you want to. Incredible Hulk. Incredible Hulk. All right, there you go. All right. So <laughs> that's some comic book guys. If you've seen uh, any of the more recent movies, right, then maybe you're aware of that statement. Well, uh, yeah, I, I couldn't get away from this. I kept thinking of that person just like it's like you know. Yeah, almost like, yeah, they're getting red in the face, and like, oh, you wouldn't like me when I'm angry, right? Well, you know, the truth is that's probably, um, that's probably all of us at one point or another, right? And we have bad days, and we have um, seasons and times and things that, that, that create more anxiety and difficulty and that make us really angry, right? So I don't want to minimize that or, or, or not walk through those situations and go, it's okay for us to get angry. 
But kind of like what we said, it's okay to not be okay. Just don't stay there. You know, we find ourselves in these patterns, like we'll talk about, of perpetual anger, or uh, maybe being in this place where we're like, you know, don't even look at me wrong, or you're going to get it, right? Like, that's that's not who we should be as believers. Uh, we should be people who, who wouldn't say, you wouldn't like me when I'm angry, right? Well, uh, maybe you find yourself in a situation where, you know, I do get upset, or I do get angry. If I haven't eaten at the right time, I might get upset. What's the Snickers commercial? Uh, well, what's the phrase? Is that it? you're not you when you're hungry, right? Now, I imagine there's some sort of situation in all of our lives that would cause us to become angry, even cause us to lash out at each other. But it's not a place that we should stay. And so I was doing some studying, and I always love um, like the data and analytics and kind of just the side of things that, that takes real-life polls and just kind of figures out where people are in society. And so there was one recent Gallup poll <clears throat> that was asking people about their experiences in life over the last couple of years compared to years ago. And they tracked all this data going back to 2007 to the end of this last year, 2022. And they put it on this uh, chart. It's called the Negative Experience Index. Negative Experience Index. You didn't, maybe you didn't know that existed. It does. Uh, and so they, they basically poll people and say, uh, you know, uh, how, ha how has this year been for you? What's happened to you? And people overall from 2007 to 2022 the negative experience index for us as a culture, the people in the United States has gone from 24% to 33%. People have said, I feel more negative. I feel like there's more negative things that have happened. If I'm being honest, I'm kind of upset about that. I even, I get more angry and agitated than I did even a few years ago. Now there was another <clears throat> interesting article put out by NPR, and this was the title of it. Americans say we're angrier than a generation ago. Now, if you've been around long enough, then, then maybe you can see that to be true. If you're like a teenager in here, then you're like, I don't know. Everybody just seems, you know, generally upset all the time about something. So, you know, maybe that wasn't always the case. But people as a whole would say, if I can look back to a generation ago, I can see that maybe things are not trending in a good direction. Uh, it's not just about the road rage. It's about our kind of our general personality and persona right now. In the article, it said this, <clears throat> do you find yourself getting ticked off more than you used to? If the answer is yes, you're not alone. Some 84% of people surveyed said Americans are angrier today compared with a generation ago, according to the latest NPR, IBM, Watson Health Poll, if you'd like to look it up. And then it says, when asked about their own feelings, 42% of those polled said they were angrier in the past year than they had ever been. I don't know if that's you today, but that sounds like a lot of people. 42% of people polled said they were angry in the last year than they'd ever been. And there's a lot of things that we get angry about, right, that we legitimately get upset about. We'll look at some of those, but then we'll also take a look at what is real anger, what do we do with it, and what's the thing that we can control? Well, it's always our response, right? It's always our response to the situation. Do we see things that make us angry? Do people do things that we don't always like? Yes, but what do we do with that? And so <clears throat> what I wanted to do is, and just to kind of kick the series off, um, share a video with you. I asked a lot of you to um, share some words over video, um, not necessarily to come up here and be in person. And my beautiful wife uh, was one of the ones that uh, volunteered to do that. And um, so I don't want to draw a lot of attention to her now because she doesn't normally like to get up in front of people, but I wanted you to hear um, her story and really the last couple of years, the things that she's been through and just kind of some of the feelings that that's produced. So go ahead and take a look at the screens. and I am a member at FPC Elba. I'm here to share my story and how God can work through scary and difficult circumstances. This is the real me. I have had epilepsy since I was a child. About a year ago in January 2022, I had several major seizures in a row. They were the most severe ones I've ever had. And at the time I was pregnant with our third child. I spent the next several days uh, at the ER in Buffalo, uh, just going through various tests just to check everything out and um, make sure I was okay and the baby was okay. And I spent that time um, in the ER just very isolated. I wasn't allowed to have any visitors during that time. And I had many people reach out uh, to me, which was very encouraging for sure, um, but just uh, that time was just very difficult, um, just 
just not knowing for sure if the baby was okay and um, why just my seizures were so much worse this time um, than the ones I've had previously. And I, it was a time of being fearful, honestly, um, just not knowing um, what exactly was going on. This time of just feeling isolated and, and worry and, and fear uh, just led to feelings of anger um, about my condition, uh, about having epilepsy. I just found myself asking, why God? Why, why do I have to have this condition? Why me? Which I'm sure many people have asked that, that have health issues, lifelong struggles. Um, even I know many people have things even worse than I do that maybe from time to time you ask, why, why are you allowing me to go through this, God? Why, why? I spent a lot of that time just thinking and telling God honest, honestly how I felt that this just isn't fair. And I know he allows us to go through things. I know he uses some things to get our attention at times, um, but I, I knew that I was walking and have been walking in obedience to him and that doesn't mean our life will be free from trials or, or difficulty, but I still was having a hard time understanding why my worst fear was coming true. I had two pregnancies um, without having any problems during those times. I didn't have any seizures and this time I did and that was just something I was always worried about and fearful of that happening um, while I was pregnant. I think God uses these times uh, where we go through um, intense difficulties, uh, struggles maybe greater than other times. Uh, these times when we just feel completely broken and I, I think he uses those to fill us up with more of him to make us more like himself and i know he'll use um, my situation and things i've learned from it to help others um, but it just brought me to the place of asking is god enough is he enough if i lose the baby is he enough if I have to go through more pain, more seizures? And ultimately during that time, that's where, what he brought me through. He brought me to that point of asking, is God enough? And he is. And if I can answer, yes, God is enough, then I can let go of my anger. I can let go of what seems unfair in a fallen world. I can let go of trying to do everything perfect because no matter what happens, God is good, he's enough. He, he's enough in my life and he will get me through every trial, every difficult circumstance that I go through. My relationship with Jesus is how I have true peace, and thank you for listening to my story. This is the real me. Wow. Well, it's hard for me to even you know watch that because it's it's part of our story, and um, if my wife can share about something going on in her life, and then I I know that every single one of you in the room can because I know her better than anybody else in the world. So, um, thank you for sharing that. Appreciate it. And uh, wow, so we when we look at this, we think about anger, we think about the situations in life, it's it's not that God is saying, hey, it's not okay to get angry because it's okay to not be okay. But it's what our response is, what do we do with that? When we, we listen to that and somebody else experiences um, difficulty and gets frustrated, gets angry by that and goes, what's, the, what's our response to this? Well, it's to trust the Lord. And while he's maybe removing something from us at the time, 
He is filling us up with himself. That's what Christy said. So as we go through this passage, um, that's what I want us to think about. So here's the first fill in the blank. There's only two. I know you're thinking, like, we have communion after service. <laughs> we got some other things going on. Uh, I get that. There's only two fill in the blanks, okay? So here's the first one. Wrong anger. Wrong anger. So you know, if you see that, I you know, I thought of this um, this picture in my mind, like of just, you know, and maybe you've been in that place before where you're like, you know, you put your fist through the drywall and you're like, I feel better, right? I don't think anybody feels better after that. No, my hand hurts. That's that's how I feel afterwards, and that was not a good idea, right? But sometimes we, we, you know, we lash out and we let that response get the best of us. Well, we're going to take a look at the life of Moses and how he responded to a difficult situation. <clears throat> so we're in verse 11 of uh, Exodus chapter 2. It says, One day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked out <clears throat> on their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his, uh, his own people. <clears throat> when I... Um, you know, I read this, you kind of have to put yourself in Moses' place. He's, he, he has a baby been put in a basket, and he's sent down the river, and, uh, you know, he gets picked up. He's in Pharaoh's household now, and, and he gets raised up as this royal person, as an Egyptian, but he's not really an Egyptian. He's a Hebrew, and he becomes aware of this, and, and he goes out to see what's going on, and what's been going on for years in Egypt. The people are being oppressed. They're being treated as slaves. They're being abused. And this, of course, is wrong. And so uh, when Moses sees this, uh, what do you think his reaction? This, this is terrible. This is wrong. And, and, and I, I have a feeling of why the uh, polls that we looked at previously indicate that people are more upset. They're more angry. We, we've seen so many things that are just wrong at, at so many levels over the last several years. You know, I think about, you know, our story and, um, and I love, you know, healthcare people who work in that field and, uh, I'm always amazed by that, but it was so hard for us. When Christy was going through her health struggles, and I, I couldn't, even, couldn't even see her. You know, it's like, oh God, what am I supposed to do? I feel, I feel helpless here, you know? And, um, and, and to be honest, that made me angry too. And so we, we experienced those situations where we're like, something's not right, something's awry, something's going on. And we look at what's going on around the world, and we see like the victimization of, uh, of a little small country like Ukraine. And we're like, why is that? continue to be allowed to go on. And a lot of us do be like, well, I would go over there and do something about it if I could, you know? Um, and there are a lot of people that are. And, and we just go like, there's something wrong. It's like, you know, maybe you were in school and you saw your friend get pushed over by a bully. And you're like, something broke in you. <laughs> and you're like, I'm not going to allow that to continue to go on. And then Robin's like, yes, <laughs> that was me. I had to do something about it. You know, it's weird. I always found myself in the principal's office, if you can imagine, man. I know it's hard to imagine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always found myself there not for, you know, like I didn't do anything. Like, I didn't, you know, victimize people. I was just like somebody, uh, like hurt somebody else who was weaker than them. And like I got involved and I'd be sitting there in the principal's office and they're calling your parents, you know, and I, I was genuinely like asking people, why am I here? Like uh, <laughs> I thought I, uh, I thought I did something to help. And they're like, well, you shouldn't have gotten involved. I'm like, well, that wasn't right. <laughs> it wasn't right. So, you know, but today we're just like, hands off, right? <laughs> Uh, don't get involved. Um, and Moses is going to have a response to this. But I want us to think about what anger actually is. Like, what are some of the signs and symptoms of that? And what does it look like if it's, like, consistently going on? One of the things I've been able to do uh, lately in the last couple of years, just with some counseling training and courses and things I've been working through, uh, is to ask some of these questions. Maybe just give some ideas to point us in the right direction. So if you think you struggle with anger, maybe somebody else close to you does. Here's some ways to uh, evaluate this. Do you often lose control or afraid of losing control? Are you irritable? Uh, it's not certain times of the day, right? If you're not a morning person, you get up too early. Maybe you're irritable or impatient or easily set off, yells or threatens others, throws, smashes things. Constant, I think of the Hulk right there, right? <laughs> the constant tension inside, hard time relaxing, always on guard, bottling up your feelings until it comes to the point of an outburst. Feeling constantly angry inside, obsessed about others, maybe a hurt from the past that somebody else has uh, done to you, holds on too much resentment, <clears throat> difficulty getting along with others, people say they are afraid of them or avoid contact, using harsh language, feeling constantly disrespected, have hurt themselves by doing something, hurting an object, putting hand through the drywall, that's what I think about. <clears throat> so there are all these things we can kind of look to and go like, is this something that happens like on occasion, or is this like a consistent pattern? And I don't want us to like point at each other or say things and be like, I know who you need to talk to. <laughs> We just need to ask this question, are any of these things 
things that are maybe a part of our own lives, things that we need to work on. So the question is, what is anger? And I got this definition from a counseling resource. Anger is a natural human emotion that God gave us to keep us safe. So we hear the word anger instead of going like it's wrong, it's bad, like it's a normal human emotion, right? We experience it. So here's the thing we need to remember. Anger itself is not unhealthy. It's what we decide to do with it that makes it healthy, unhealthy, or not. Um, so the question is, what's our response? Again, we have to go back to this. Not that feeling angry or like seeing injustice and like wanting to do something about it. Maybe I went about it the wrong way. Maybe punching the bully in the face wasn't the best idea. But, um, you know, we, we get in those situations where like, I just, I know what I need to do. I need to react right now. And sometimes that's not always the best thing to do, right? So it's okay to feel angry, right? It's okay. Because I feel angry right now. Maybe you're upset about something. So what did Moses do? Well, in verse 12, it says, He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. Oh, is this Moses? <laughs> yeah, it was. So this is a guy who's a giant of the faith, and he led God's people, which should give us hope, right? If God can use Moses, then he can use anybody. In fact, if you looked at almost anybody in the scripture, you'd be like, if God can use that person, I, I think he could use, you know, he could use me to do something, right? But what does Moses do? He sees the injustice. And he acts, only you would think, well, is he just defending that person? Self-defense? Not really. It says he looked this way and that. Have you ever done that? Kids, maybe? <laughs> oh, I love it. He's shaking. He's so honest. He's like, I've done that. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's like, hey, is anybody watching? Because I'm about to do something I should not do. And if anybody in an authority role sees this, I will get in serious trouble. But if they're not watching, well, what was God, what was Moses concerned about? He, he wasn't concerned about the authority of man, right? Although he was a little, he was like, is anybody around? And then he goes and he just does it. At any point in that angry outburst, in that expression of his anger, do you think he was concerned about what God wanted? No. And these people were people that he lived with, these Egyptians. And although they were treating his real people badly, harshly, it wasn't self-defense, right? He jumps in there and he goes, is anybody watching i'm about to do something i should not do and it says and seeing no one he struck down the egyptian and hit him in the sand so this is this is troubling at a variety of levels right most of us would go like yeah murder is wrong everybody's like yes <laughs> don't murder anyone ten commandments right you know that's part of our law in our society uh, you're going to get in a lot of trouble if you do that so what did he do well he carried out the anger in secret so we talked about that and it says that he killed he struck down there's really no, no secret there about what's taking place he he Check to see what was going on, and he killed a person, right? That's bad. It's not right. Most of us would say that's a problem. And then what does he do after that? He hid the act of what took place. Now, some of you may go, well, you know, uh, some of the things I do aren't that big of a deal. I may check to see if anybody's looking because I say I'm on a diet, and then I'm like, cookie jar, <laughs> right? I know we've done it before, like our New Year's resolution gets you know, almost the end of March, so they're pretty much all gone, but... You know, and maybe some of you are stuck with it, and you're like, you know, is anybody looking? Because if I eat it and nobody's looking, it doesn't count, right? We all do that over the holidays. You're like, it's the holidays. It doesn't count. People can see that. It doesn't matter. They'll understand. But what Moses did was wrong, and he looked both ways. Is anybody watching? He struck him down. And then what did he do? <clears throat> I don't know. <laughs> he hit him in the sand, right? So is there any question, like, is he... Is he concerned? Maybe a little bit about other people finding out. So he, he does this. <clears throat> now, the interesting thing to me is we think about what anger really does to us. Um, you look at any like anything related to psychology and anger, it, here's a good rule of thumb. You should never do anything, the things that come into your mind, as something makes you angry. Or as something happens, let's say somebody says something to you and you're like, that, that makes me angry. And I'd like to do something, but we shouldn't. Uh, most psychologists would say you need to take about 20 minutes. There's this part of your body that needs to reset after you've had an intense moment or situation or an angry thought. And you need to drink some water and you need to wait about 20 minutes. And then at that point, you should go, God, well, what should I do? <laughs> and you might make a better choice, but clearly this is not what took place for Moses. So when Jesus talks about anger in the Sermon on the Mount, he says this in chapter 5, verse 21. <clears throat> you've heard, it, heard that it was said, to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and, remember, and you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift, therefore, 
and go <clears throat> before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer for your guilt. So this is hard. Like when Jesus addresses like the real issues of our hearts and our minds, he's not going like, yeah, obviously you don't kill anybody. Yeah, you're going you're gonna to suffer some penalties at a civil level that you don't want to have to deal with as just a regular human being. But, but what's really inside of us? Like what's the motivations of our heart? Are we hanging on to anger and bitterness and resentment? Things that are only going to boil to the surface and cause us to lash out in anger at other people, maybe people that didn't have anything to do with the situation, right? We're not talking to anybody anyway, right? And we've all experienced those things, but the question is, what do we do with it? Well, Moses did the wrong thing, and here in verse 13, back in Exodus, it says, And when he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together. And he said to the men in the wrong, so they were doing something wrong, uh, they said to the men uh, doing the wrong, well, what happened? <clears throat> this was the next day, of course. The two Hebrews, they were struggling, and he said to the men in the wrong, why do you strike your companion? Maybe there's an argument, a shove, a push, and they were in the wrong, and Moses is like, mm -hmm. right? You shouldn't be doing that. Uh, but the secret has maybe already come out. Because then in verse 14, it says, uh, he answered, who made you prince and a judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, surely the thing is known. We're pretty good at hiding things, aren't we? Moses hit something terrible, right? Awful. Something that he thought he could cover up. And then when it comes out and he says, kind of like what Jesus said, maybe we should worry about the log in our own eye before we take the speck out of somebody else's. And Moses is going, hey, you guys shouldn't push and shove each other. <laughs> you shouldn't do that. And they're like, who are you to talk to us? Are you a judge over us? Why? Because they knew what had taken place. And then Moses was afraid. Have you ever felt like that? Maybe been in a situation that you didn't need to be in, and you're like, you're like the, the, the anger, you know, it wears off, right? There's that time period, the 20-minute time has worn off, and you've had some water, you sat down, and, you know, and you're like, why am I here? I don't understand what happened. What did I do? Oh, wait a second. Maybe that wasn't the right way to handle the situation, right? And so Moses comes to this place of uh, Yare in the Hebrew. It says fear, but it's actually the same word that is used when, when, when we should approach God, like we should come to him in fear and reverence, in Yare. And, and Moses is like, I can't believe this has happened. Well, how did it happen? Huh? He was able to, <laughs> to just react in the moment. And he didn't take a moment to think about what was taking place. And so he experienced this fear. And there's some results of this. I mean, no matter where you live, murder is wrong, right? So uh, in verse 15, it says, When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian. And he sat down by the well. So here's Moses' story in a nutshell. He goes, he's in Egypt. He becomes a prince of Egypt. If you've seen the movie, a little inaccurate. You know, we call it a cartoon movie. Uh, but, but And then he decides, oh, okay, you know, now it's okay. I'm going to get angry. I'm going to take justice. I'm going to do something for somebody else. Well, he's done it out of his anger. And now he finds himself in this position of the people that he was raised by. He was a prince of Egypt. Yeah, now, because of our law, you have to die. And what does Moses do? Well, he's obviously in the wrong. He runs away in fear, right? And he's going to have quite a while to think about it. Forty years in Midian. And God begins to work on his heart and his mind. And, and, I, and I hope for us that maybe we wouldn't be in this place, as we transition from the story of Moses to see what Jesus did, that we wouldn't be in this place of going, not that it's not okay to be okay, right? We're, we're, it's okay to not be okay. Just don't stay there. But, but maybe don't take 40 years to work it out, right? Or maybe don't allow yourself to get to the point where you're like, you know, maybe I should talk to somebody about this. Maybe there's something going on. Maybe I should be open to somebody else talking to me about it. Maybe if you're thinking of praying of somebody that you that you need to recommend, and that's okay too, but don't take all this time to figure it out, right? Maybe God's just giving us an opportunity to say, hey, you know what, maybe there is something that's like just kind of surface level right now, and if I talked about it now, then it wouldn't boil over the surface 10 years from now, or have some sort of terrible outburst, right? People are like, what happened to you? Maybe you didn't deal with it a long time ago, and so let's not be like that. Let's uh, maybe be a little bit more like Jesus. And so this is the second fill in the blank. Right anger. So there's wrong anger. There's right anger. The right way to handle things. So we're going to look at what Jesus did in response to um, a situation that made him angry. John chapter 2, 
verse 13 through 17. Verse 13 through 17. It says, The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. So this would have been a regular practice. So if you were Jewish, you would go um, to Jerusalem during this time. You would give your offerings. There would be the temple. And, and something was taking place, though. And we have to remember in this context that whose house was this? The temple. It was God's house. Who's Jesus? God. So he comes to his house, and he sees that something is taking place. And in verse 14, it says, In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and money changers sitting there. So there was a selling of things going on in the temple. Now, typically, most of this would take place outside of the temple. But, I mean, Holy Week, there's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of sacrifices need to be had. So they think, you know what? We're going to sell this right out of the, the Holy Temple in Jerusalem. Uh, we got the money changers here. You know, if you need to change your currency, whatever needs to happen, then you can do it here. And, and something happens inside of Jesus. God of the universe, who is fully man and fully God, who comes to Jerusalem, to the temple, to his house. And there's an injustice. There's something that's going on that's not right. And in verse 15, it's probably one of the most misunderstood verses um, in the Bible. It's certainly one that maybe is hard for us to read and understand, but we're going to try to do that today. It says in verse 15, In making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned the tables. <clears throat> Overreaction? <laughs> I know a lot of us, when we read that, we think like, man, Jesus, like, did you not get enough sleep? <laughs> oh, what was going on there? But when we read this, we have to understand it in its context. What, what's taking place? We've already said this. Jesus is God. He was fully man, fully God. This was his house, his temple, which, by the way, <clears throat> when they went to the temple then, that was the holy place. And, and now where does the temple reside? Is this this building? This building belongs to God too, right? All of us as members. But the temple of God, through the Holy Spirit, which he gives to us, resides in ourselves. We've become these temples. And so if we could think about it like this, what happens when somebody maybe violate your space or your house. Like I, I was thinking about this this week because I was like, why do you get so upset? If this is God's house, can you imagine somebody breaking into your house, taking your stuff, maybe leaving things that don't belong, trash in the place? <clears throat> when I was growing up, this happened to me. So I was about 12 years old and we were away on a doctor's appointment. My dad was at work and so and my mom and the kids, we came home, and we went through the front door. Typically, bad guys don't go in through the front door. Also, so it's the back door they go in. And that was exactly what happened. So I opened the door, unlocked it, and I noticed that the back door has been kicked in. And then I noticed a lot of other things that don't seem right. And so I grabbed one of my brothers was already running there, just oblivious, and I'm like, I grab him, and I'm like, get, <laughs> get out of the house. So we leave really quickly, call 911. You know, the police come and do their thing, you know, clear everything. And everything's good, and then do the report and all that stuff. And they're like, okay, we're done. We'll figure it out from there. But I can't tell you, like, the anger that that produced in me as a kid. It's like you walk into your space, and the place has been trashed. Your stuff's been taken. And, and maybe if anything like that has uh, ever happened to you, then you can maybe understand how Jesus felt. What are they doing in my house? What are they doing in God's house? And so he responds to this in kind. And it's kind of this unique picture for us when we, we think about who God is and like you know, his judgment and like his self-restraint. Can you imagine God of the universe who, who, who comes to earth, who diminishes himself in, in this, uh, this role of being a human being fully, and then he experiences life and he comes to his house and he's like, what are the, what are the people doing? Maybe we don't really fully understand the restraint of God. I like what Matt was saying um, during the quiet time talk. He kind of brought us back to this place. Like even atheists or scientists are like something that didn't exist inside of our space time continuum had to create, had to start things, had to create the world that we live in. Do we, do we think about Jesus like that? So he comes in, he turns over some tables and says, get those animals out of here. <laughs> they don't belong in here. You can do the animal, you can purchase the animals out here, then make the sacrifice inside of God's house. But don't do that here. I want to read an account to you from Matthew chapter 26 because I think it helps us understand um, who Jesus is and just how much restraint he showed over and over and over again as people mocked him to his face and eventually went to the cross. And here's what happens right before he goes to the cross in Matthew chapter 26, verses 47. Well, we'll start there. We'll see where we get. Um, Matthew 26, verse 47, it says, While he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, 
and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given him a sign saying, the one I will kiss as the man sees him. And he came up to Jesus and at once, greetings, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And Jesus said to him, friend, do what you came to do. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, put your sword back in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Verse 53, do you, do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send more than 12 legions of angels? So Jesus comes into the temple and his house has been violated. And we think, like, Jesus, overreaction. Was it really? And Jesus gets taken and all these people, it's a, it's a comical scene. I'm sure that's what Jesus was thinking when he, you know, they're all coming with swords and clubs. I'm like, we're going to get Jesus. <laughs> God of the universe, I don't know. I think he allowed you to do that if you did, right? And he even states here, like, look, if I wanted to handle things, <laughs> what do you think I would do? I would handle it, right? And that's what the God of the universe has, the accessibility and the power to do. In fact, we, we just really don't think about Jesus himself as he was on earth in a holy way like we should. It says here in Hebrews 1, 3, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his mouth. God could just stop talking and everything would cease to exist in it. And if, if if scientists who are atheists are like, you know, I think somebody had to have, you know, done this who existed outside of all this. And we look back to a holy God, a Jesus who put himself in our shoes and he did not have to. And he, he walked that road and he, and, he, and he walked into that temple and he said, this is not how my house is going to be. How do you think he feels about us? What we do with our own bodies and our own minds and our own hearts if we're the temple and we think at times that Jesus overreacts. Let's keep going. Verse 16, it says, And he told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. What was this house supposed to be? A house of worship, of reverence, of sacrifice. He said, This isn't what my house is going to be like. Verse 17, His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. I, I thought back to an account, and I'll close shortly, but um, we were having BBS, and we had really bad weather. Um, I think we had um, we we'd set up the planter, had it in place before, uh, to bring the kids over. So we brought the kids over, and BBS was over that night after a bad storm that we had. Uh, we, had to, we had to come over the next day, too, I think. And so one of the kids is going out, and his dad's coming to get him, and he stops, and I'm holding the door for people. And um, he looks up at me, and he goes, are you the pastor? And I said, yeah, that's, that's what they say that I am. So that's what I am, I guess. And, uh, and he's like, so you're like the boss of the church. <laughs> he's like standing up at me, you know, in awe. And I'm not that tall of a guy anyway, so I'm like, there's no reason to do that. And, uh, and so I was like, you know, without explaining how we're governed and all that, we're deacon-led and we're congregationally uh, governed and we vote, I just said like, look, I'm not the boss of the church. God is. This is his house. Everything belongs to him. And, and maybe maybe if we could put ourselves in that place where even the disciples were like, oh, we get it. Remember what Psalm 69, 9 said about God. Zeal for your house will consume me. And this was a right thing to get angry about, right? This was a right response to injustice and how God's house was treated, not premeditated, premeditated murder like Moses did, and then hiding it. But zeal for your house will consume me. And if God's the boss, then I don't know. Maybe that will govern the way that we live and operate. It's okay to get angry about stuff, right? It's okay to get upset about injustice. It's okay to get upset about things that, that are normal, right? To get upset about. But maybe not to harbor resentment and anger. Maybe not to store up those things and go like, well, well if they did that, then I will never forgive them. Or I will, you just don't know what they did. And I can't even, I can't even talk about it. Right? But if these things we hold on to, if the things that happen in our lives that genuinely make us angry, we stick to, and we say, I just, I can't even do that. Maybe the place to start is this. Maybe we start the conversation. We can, can't help. We can be honest. And maybe if you see this in somebody else's life, it's okay to start the conversation. And, and maybe if an angry response comes out, that may be a helpful indicator of where we need to go. 
Um, I'll close with this. Um, there was another survey I looked at that talked about anger. And it said this, anger is a natural human reaction to situations that we dislike, but it isn't a very effective one. If we take a moment to think about the consequences of anger, we'll realize that it rarely solves whatever problem provoked it. If we become angry about another person's behavior, it probably won't result in them changing that behavior. If we become angry about an unfavorable event that befalls us, our anger will do nothing to reverse what has happened. What's worse is the anger inhibits our ability to respond to the situation intelligently. Psychological studies have shown people process information less thoroughly and judge others more harshly when they're angry and cause us to behave in ways that only perpetuate anger instead of addressing the cause. So what's going on in your life today? Are you upset about something? Or are you angry about something? If you were like a lot of people, <laughs> ask that question, in the last year we could probably say yes. And we probably have a good reason for it. But are you still in that place? It's okay to not be okay. Just don't stay there. And if you haven't done this, I just want to share this with you real quickly. If you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, then the ability to handle anger and move past some of these things and process some of these things becomes even more difficult. So if that's you, you want to make that decision today, I'll be here. What we believe is it's really just about this, believing that Jesus, that Jesus was God's son, that he came and lived this in this life for us, and he died on the cross so we might have eternal life. And that's you. I'll be here. I'd love to talk to you about that afterwards. But maybe we just need to take a step. Maybe we need to talk to somebody. Maybe you felt like you've been dealing with anger for a while. And you just don't know what to do with it. Well, who would I talk to? Who would I say something? Say something to a friend, family member, your spouse. would be a good place to start. And maybe if you're like, I just don't know how to deal with this. I don't, I don't have the tools to do that. There's people to help, right? And I'd love to be that person for you. Uh, if, if I'm not, then I'd love to direct you to somebody who can. But maybe we just need to start the process because there's wrong anger, there's wrong way to handle it, and there's right anger, and the right way to handle it. And um, I hope we've seen that today in the text. Uh, what I'd like to do is um, pray for us um, as we think about starting that conversation, um, and then we will enter into our communion time together. Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for this word, um, God, that we can look throughout the expanse of time, uh, God, people that you used that made terrible mistakes. God, we, we know that that gives us hope. Um, that you might use us no matter where we find ourselves even today. Um, God, that the anger that uh, is inside of every single one of us is a normal human emotion that you've, you've made us, God, like this. And so we just pray that we would uh, appropriately handle these things. You'd help us to manage them. And God, if we feel like we're struggling, if we feel like we just have got unmanaged anger that's going on, causes us to lash out, God, I pray that you would help us start the process of managing that. Maybe we just need to reach out and ask for help. I pray that we could do that. There'd be no, uh, there'd be no shame in this place for sharing our problems. We all have them. They're just different. Uh, I pray we could be honest about those as we continue to pursue you. It's your name we pray.